Okay, in uh, investment casting, or sometimes it's referred to as lost wax casting, uh, unlike sand casting where you can use your model and your pattern over and over again, for every lost wax or investment casting that's done, that model is lost in the form of the wax that's burnt out and replaced with the molted metal. So as a result, if you want multiple castings, you have to have some way of generating multiple wax patterns. So I'll show you a little bit about how I go about making the molds and then we'll demonstrate injecting the wax into one of the molds to, to see the process of making the multiple wax patterns. In front of us here, to the left, is a, a clay and what I've done is spread it out on the base of a, just a piece of uh, plexiglass and in front of it there is a little brass uh, form piece I refer to as a sprue former and I have a piece of wax attached to it and attached to the end of that wax is, is a Lincoln penny, a US one, one cent piece. The piece to the right was made from PVC pipe. You can use PVC, brass tubing, aluminum tubing, whatever, but this is going to be the frame for your mold. And uh, typically I'll put a one and a half to two degree taper on the inside of this uh, mold frame. And I'll demonstrate in a minute the, the purpose for that. But let me show you how I set this guy up before pouring the mold material. I'm sorry, the, well, the mold material. In this case, uh, I use RTV. What I do is take the, the piece that I want to make the mold of, in this case, the penny, and I'll press it down into the clay so it's attached pretty firmly. And then taking the PVC pipe with the taper on it, I will go around it and press it down into the clay and seal it. So now what we have is we have our model inside the mold frame. It's sealed. And then we will mix up the RTV rubber and pour it into the mold frame to generate the, the mold. Here's an example, I'll open it up, of a mold that was done for one of the uh, parts on the Wilton Vice. This, this setup was just very similar to what I demonstrated on the penny, but here's the mold after the RTV material vulcanizes overnight. You then take it out of the, the tapered frame and cut it with the X-Acto or razor knife and part it the best you can down the center line. And it's uh, not that critical as long as you can get the two pieces to go back together. Uh, the black piece in this case is a core and uh, what will the reason for the taper is after you've injected or shot your wax into the mold when you open the mold up and remove your wax model you put it back in for a, another run this taper goes down and you give it a slight tap and it locks it in and it makes a real tight fit with the two halves of the mold so when the wax is injected through the sprue opening from the wax injector it helps reduce any tendency for the mold to separate and open up which will call, cause flashing. The, for years in the jewelry industry most of the molds uh, were parallel sided molds and they were cut in, cut in half and you would hold a couple of plates on each side of the mold and, and inject this 
into the, the wax injector. Well, it's kind of awkward to try to keep even pressure on here and keep your wax pressure from opening up and, and causing uh, flashing. So I've never used this. I never have liked that method. I prefer the tapered mold. I've also, over the years, for bigger parts where it's not practical to have a, a tube, I make the boxes and the boxes that I've made here have a taper. There's a taper on the top and a taper on the bottom. And when you, the advantage of doing a box like this, you can pre-establish your parting lines with clay and pour one half of the rubber or the molded material and get half of your uh, pour and then you remove the clay and put a mold release on and pour the second part and you'll end up with a mold where the parting lines have already been established in your two-part mold and you don't have to worry about cutting. Now because one, the top and one side is tapered when you take your model out and get ready to inject your wax it slips down there and you can just d give it a little tap and it locks the mold in just like on the, the tapered molds done with the cylinders it prevents flashing it's a very effective uh, way to to make larger molds Okay, what we have here is my small wax injecting pot. Uh, the temperature controller which keeps it regulated for the proper temperature for the wax that you're using. And in front of the temperature controller there are three molds. Uh, they are, there's three molds for parts for the little Wilton vise which is over here on, on the side. And what I'm going to do is, is just let the camera run. I'm going to kind of stand aside and I'm going to sequence through all three of these molds by injecting them and what I'll do first is inject uh, the three molds and then by the time I get the third mold injected I'll come back to the first mold and open it up and remove the wax injecting. The wax that's in the, the injection pot starts out as flakes they're just little pellets of, uh, and then they, they melt and this particular uh, injection pot is a hand operated it's, it's got a little hand pump in it uh, I'll zoom in here where you get a closer view of the the wax coming out of the nozzle Okay, as I raise the lever on the pump and come down, you should, see, you should be able to see the wax escaping from the, the sprue opening here. So I'm going to start off with this, this small mold here, raise it up, and just real gently push down. And when the mold fills, you will feel back pressure on the mold so you at that point you stop pressure you stop pushing and just hold it for a, a few seconds and give the wax a little time to cool okay the, the part of leaving the pressure on the uh, mold after you feel, feel that it has uh, filled uh, is real critical because it keeps the wax from uh, sucking in and it keeps pressure while it's cooling to give you a better cleaner mold. So what we'll do now is open up the three that we, that we shot. Uh, this particular piece here is the end cap for the uh, Wilton vise. There's a core inside of this mold to form the, the hole. And I'll remove the core and 
there's our part. So by placing the core back in the mold, putting the mold back together, dropping it in the uh, in the tapered mold, giving it that little little tap, we're ready to shoot another one. So it just it's best to, when you're shooting the molds to, to have multiple molds set up so you can sequence through. Uh, this was the second one that we injected. It's the front jaw. It also has a has a core in it and We just do a slight twist and pull the core out and there's this another wax model uh, Same procedure put your core back in the mold Drop the mold back into the mold frame Okay, I put the core in backwards. It's always harder to do something when you're trying to film it. Okay, let's try that now. Got another one. The last one that we shot on the first go around was the base for the uh, the Wilton Vice, the big black uh, core. I think it's a piece of Delrin that helps form the, the opening in the uh, in the base. So what we'll do is we'll put we'll try to group them and put one of each wax that we just shot in a grouping along with the body. Okay, here's a, a group shot of the three molds that we just injected with a, a sample of the wax that we took out of the mold, sitting on top of each mold and the little vise in front of it. At this point, uh, what we're going to do is take these things and attach them to a tree, and they'll go inside of a flask that will be filled with investment. So what I'm going to do is get set up to show you how I attach these multiple waxes to a tree for doing multiple castings of, of the parts. So we'll be back in a minute. Okay, uh, in the background you see the flask size that we'll be using. I think it's a two and a half inch diameter by four inches tall. And in front of it, the rubber base that this flask will be pushed down into and seal the flask so when you pour it in but uh, it won't leak out the bottom. The flask will be wrapped with uh, masking tape uh, until the investment sets up and then it will be removed for the burnout process. Our objective here is to try to get as many parts as we can on that red uh, sprue that's attached to the the uh, sprue base there, the rubber sprue base. And to the right, you see a, a casting I did yesterday and it is loaded with uh, many small parts. So what we try to do is be as effective as we can because the investment is expensive, the whole process is time consuming. So what we try to do is get as many parts out here as we can. Now, a uh, little point here, most all of the sprue bases that's commercially available are very similar to the one you see here. They fit the diameter of your of your flask size that you're using. Well, sometimes uh, the geometry of the part that you want to use is is not compatible with the the size. And what I mean by that, if I wanted to attach several of these little vices to this sprue, the problem is it's too big and it will push the part too close to the side of the or, or not at all. So you know you, you typically your option is to go to a larger flask. Well you go to a larger flask it uh, increases everything, the cost of investment, your burnout time, etc. So what I came up with is I take these uh, rubber sprue bases traditional like this where the, the sprue is in the center and I take and cut it out, get rid of it, 
And then on the lathe, I turned down a tapered sprue base. And now I can offset this from the center of the base and I just barely attach it with some tacky wax and seal it with wax at the bottom and uh, put my sprue on the top of the white sprue base there. And now, with <coughs> in this configuration, it gives me a lot more capacity within a, a small size flask. So now I can go in and mount multiples away at a different angle and I'm not restricted by the distance that I had to live with when the sprue was in the center. So just, just a little idea I came up with. It's, uh, I use it quite often. Now, let me, let me show you what we've got on the table here for attaching these uh, waxes to the sprue base. Off to the right here, uh, the outlet box, there's a rheostat in there. I think it came off of a fan uh, dimmer, or light, a light dimmer. So there's a rheostat in there that controls two outlets. These two outlets, I have low wattage 30, 35 watt soldered irons. And I can regulate the setting on this rheostat to get the temperature of the soldering irons just where I want it for melting and working with the wax. Uh, off to the right, or I'm sorry, off to the left here, is there's some sampling of the different types of waxes that that I use and most everybody in this, this business uses. The red stick to the right is referred to as, as sprue wax. That's what's sticking up in into the sprue that I'm going to attach my multiple parts to. The little skinny yellow uh, piece is just a smaller size sprue wax and it comes in, it goes all the way down in size to uh, go into the thousands. The uh, ye light yellow wax to the to the left, moving down the line. This is referred to as tacky or sticky wax, and, uh, and that's exactly what it is. And what I've done is taken a couple of sticks of this and melted it into the little lid that's that's in front of it. And when you first attach a piece to your sprue, just a slight little dab of that uh, will let you tack it in place until it, it'll hold, until you can seal it around to make sure you've got a good, good seal joint all the way around the sprue. The brown stick, uh, flat stick, is uh, referred to as sculptor's wax. And this is, uh, you can take it and knead it and work it with your fingers and, and work it around and, and sculpt. And the more you work it and, and, and knead it together, it gets more pliable. This is typically what sculptors use for making their, uh, their, their sculptures prior to uh, having them cast. And what I've used this for quite successfully is uh, doing inlay work. And what I mean by that, if I want to inlay some metal into wood or ivory or whatever, I will work, work out the cavity in the wood, the ivory, and typically either using the pantograph or the CNC, I will uh, route it out and put a cavity into the material. You take the sculptor's wax and press it down inside of the cavity and then when it gets pressed into the cavity you just leave a slight skin connecting in this case here to, so that all the letters will connect and you rub it with, with ice and harden it and once it gets good and hard with light air pressure you can blow it out and then this can be sprued up and cast and when you cast it, it will drop right back into the cavity uh, that you blew it out of. You leave a, the skin a little proud, so once you put it down in the cavity, you can file it and sand it down and, and, and blend it in with the material. The, uh, the next wax here, the purple stuff is referred to as uh, purple buildup, I think that's what it's called. But it's specially formulated so if you've got a, a pattern, a wax pattern that's got a little void in it or a defect in it that didn't quite get filled when you ejected it, the, 
the characteristics of this wax, it melts at a lot lower temperature than your injection wax and it flows really smooth. So you put a little on the end of the solder iron and you touch it and it will blend in and fill any voids. Uh, usually it's best once you get the void filled, just leave it alone, wait till it's cast and then work it down with files versus trying to clean it up in, in the wax environment. So what, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to get the camera set up and zoomed in on my, uh, my sprue base that I work from and uh, I'll start attaching some parts to the sprue. I have already sized the length of the main sprue such that when it's attached to the base and the flask is set down uh, around the, the sprue brace prior to pouring the uh, investment in the flask, the sprue is of the right length. You have to be careful and not to get the sprue too long so that it comes too close to the top of the flask. In this case here, I've allowed for about oh, a little over a half inch clearance between the top of the sprue and what's going to be the top of the uh, investment once the flask is poured. If that distance is not maintained, there won't be enough investment uh, in the top of the flask that when you put it in a vacuum unit, sometimes the vacuum will pull it and break it loose and uh, disaster happens. So this little articulating base here enables me to position the, uh, the part or the sprue so that I can get to it, rotate it, twist it. And what I'm going to do in each one of these cases is take the, the sticky wax here, real tacky, and just put a little drop of it onto the, uh, the runner there. And let's see. It's always, you always have to figure out the best way to, to orient these things. I think this is going to, so what I'll do is just melt a little, little detent in here, and I still got my sticky wax on there, and I'll tack it in place. And once it's in place, you can go around and seal using the sticky wax and make sure there's no gaps and in this case here I want to lower it just a little bit so while while the wax is still tacky and bring it down at a little lower angle so that I'm not getting too close out to the edge that looks good there so I've got quite a few of these to do. I'll, I'll just repeat the, repeat the process as I go around. Uh, apply the sticky wax, put a little detent there. And you try to group these and lay them out the, the best you can to, to get maximum uh, utilization, you know, of the space inside the flask. What I'm going to do at this point is uh, go ahead. My, my goal is, is to try to get all of these waxes that you see on the, the sheet of paper towel here, try to get all of these mounted uh, onto this sprue and it'll be quite tight uh, once I get there. Uh, again, here's an example of one I did the other day that's already been cast. So we'll load it up with as many parts uh, as we can get on there, and uh, I'll come back and, and we'll do a shot of it once I get it, it loaded up, and you'll see what it's gonna look like before we pour the investment over the, the wax models. We've got all the parts attached to the main sprue and we managed to get them all on there. As you can see, it's fairly crowded. I've also wrapped masking tape around the flask 
and at this point what we're ready to do is slip the uh, flask down over the the base and uh, you know to surround the parts and then we'll we'll go mix up some investment and pour the investment uh, into the flask so that it will surround all of the waxes so that wraps up the the piece about uh, attaching the parts to the main sprue Okay, let's go pour some investment. Fill it up. Okay, we're getting ready to uh, mix up the investment and uh, pour them in the flask. Just an overview of the process. One of the things you really have to pay attention to is accurate measurements on the weight of your investment versus the amount of water. It's very critical and every manufacturer of investment will provide you with a chart to follow and it's uh, very critical that you maintain the exact weight and water ratios when mixing. You put the water in the bowl and always add and pour the investment to the water. Uh, I've already pre-measured. I have two pounds of investment sitting on the scale and in the black uh, rubber mixing bowl that's sitting on top of the vacuum unit I've measured out the appropriate amount of water for two pounds of investment. This should give us enough uh, investment to pour uh, and fill up two flasks. When the investment and water mix that's the start of your cycle and you have exactly nine minutes to, uh, to finish. If you exceed the nine minute limit, your investment's gonna start setting up and getting hard. So we've gotta do all this in, in nine minutes. We first mix the investment in the bowl, degas it, and then pour it into the flask and then degas the flask. And at that time, when you set the flask down, they should remain undisturbed until the investment sets. So we got to do it all in nine minutes. Uh, there's plenty of time, but you just you you don't have time to stop and answer the telephone. So with that said, uh, we'll we'll start the uh, pour, and I'm going to focus in here a little bit closer, so maybe you can get a better better view. So there's your two two pounds of investment. We've already got the water in the mixing bowl. We're going to add the investment to the water. Typically I'll hand stir it initially <clears throat> to get the water and the investment pre-mixed before I hit it with the electric uh, stir.
not sure if you can see the vacuum gauge on the vacuum unit, but it's going to come up to 26, 27 inches. Full vacuum, the investment in the under the bell jar will start rising. And once it gets past 26 degrees and gets pretty much all the air out of the investment, it will then collapse and fall down in the mixing jar. Okay, it, it just peaked out and it just it just fell. So at that point, we pretty much got all the air out of the investment. We'll turn the vacuum off. Grab a couple of uh, flasks here. I like to pour the investment down the side of the flask, not directly onto the uh, waxes because they, they are fairly fragile. Okay, we're gonna re-vacuum it. And as I'm vacuuming it this time, I will be jogging the plate on here to help get the investment mixed around and hopefully in that ever crack and crevice inside of the waxes. Now, once, uh, once you've done the final vacuuming, set the flask aside and do not disturb them until the investment gets completely hard. Okay, that wraps up the uh, investment pouring process. We have six flasks and we'll leave these set for a couple hours until they cure a little bit more and then we'll put them in the uh, high temperature oven and take them through the prescribed uh, burnout cycle. Depending on the size of your flask, you either have a, a anywhere from a six, eight, or a 12 hour cycle. Obviously, the larger your flask, you're gonna have to bake them and take them through a, a longer cycle. The size of these flasks will take them through an eight hour cycle, starting out at 300 degrees, going up to 700, then 1,000, and then we'll hold it at 1,350 degrees for about three and a half hours and then ramp it back down to the casting temperature that we want the flask to be at. And in our case, we're gonna be casting these in uh, aluminum bronze and the recommended flask temperature for aluminum bronze is 1,100 degrees. So we'll ramp it down from 1,350 to 1,100 degrees, let it stabilize for an hour, hour and a half, so that the flask throughout is 1100 degrees. And at that point, we will take them out of the oven one at a time and put them in the vacuum unit and uh, pour the molten metal and hope we get some decent castings out of it. See you when we st start the, uh, the casting process. Okay, what, what we're going to do here is attempt to do a live uh, filming of a live investment casting demonstration. We're looking at the burnout oven right now, and there are six stainless steel flasks in the oven that have been in here or in the oven for about eight hours going through a regimented burnout cycle. 
the flasks have completely burned out all of the wax that was inside of the investment is no longer uh, is completely gone the flash temperature is roughly 1100 degrees and we're going to go through and, uh, and pour a few of these and hopefully uh, uh, film them as we're going through the operation what I'm going to do real quick is open the oven door so you can see the flasks that are inside the oven awaiting to be investment cast or poured okay that's a good shot so what I'm gonna do next is reposition the camera and show you the the two pieces of equipment that we'll be using for the investment casting okay the, the unit on the right is an electric furnace that uh, currently is at 2075 degrees and it contains about a pound and a half of molted aluminum bronze alloy that we're going to be pouring. Uh, <clears throat> the unit to the right is a vacuum unit. The, when, when I begin the casting process, I will take the flask out of the oven and walk over to the vacuum unit with the hot flask and drop it down into the vacuum chamber. There's a flask sitting on top of the ch uh, unit right now, but it's empty. There's nothing in it just to show you the size of the flask that we will be casting. So once I drop the, the flask down into the vacuum chamber, I will turn the machine on and watch the vacuum gauge to ensure that I have a good seal of the flask. And once I verify that, I will take the graphite crucible out of the electric furnace and pour the molten metal into the investment flask. As soon as it pours and it's full, I will put the crucible back in the electric furnace so it continue to stay hot and I will let the, the poured flask set on the vacuum unit for just a little bit until the, the hot button solidifies enough that I can safely take it out of the vacuum chamber and set it over on the bricks to the left. At that point, if all goes well, I will continue to work and by going and taking another flask out of the oven and repeating the process. Uh, if all goes well, I'll just leave the camera running. I have enough molten metal in the furnace to pour three, three flasks and we might have to pause uh, you know at one point to let the metal get back up to temperature because when you pour it and put the crucible back in it cools down. With that said uh, because there's so much going on it's so quick as you're doing this process uh, I probably it will be a silent pour uh, unless I can manage a word in here or there but typically it's just uh, a bit gonna be a visual uh, recording at this point on okay here we go Okay, you see the button is pretty well solidified. It's going to stay cherry red for a few more minutes. At this point, I'm going to back the camera back to original position and grab a couple of more flasks and, and pour those at this time.
<clears throat> okay, well, that, let that one cool down for just a bit before we remove it and set it on the bricks. At this point, I'm going to pick up the first flask that we cast. The button and the metal has appeared to cool enough, so we're going to dunk it and quench it and see what the casting looks like. Let me try to focus in here on the barrel. Okay, so we're going to dunk it in here. The water is going to react with the hot investment. And hopefully we'll have a set of castings fall out in our hand here shortly. Okay, uh, looks like a keeper. We got eight barrels for the 1911 and eight hammers. We'll get some close-up shots of these later. Meanwhile, I'm going to position the camera for the next pour. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to remove the flask that's in the unit, the vacuum unit. Okay guys, uh, as I said earlier, this was a live demonstration, so if, with anything live, uh, things go wrong. Now, one of the rules in investment casting, when you put your parts inside the flask, you have to maintain a minimum separation between the top of the flask and the top of your, your waxes. What happened, I exceeded that and I did not get away with it. When I placed this flask in the vacuum chamber and turned on the vacuum, I heard a pop and I knew something was wrong. What happened is my parts had been placed too close <clears throat> to the top of the flask and there was not enough investment in the flask to withstand the vacuum pressure and what happened is the vacuum pulled out and separated some of the investment and broke away and obviously at that point had I poured the molten metal it would have gone straight through into the vacuum chamber and I recognized what had happened so I turned it off and, and removed this this flask so so far we've put, tried to pour three uh, I'm sorry four flasks we've had a what appears to be three successful pours. This was the first one that I dunked into the uh, into the water and the casting came out. Don't want to pick it up. It's about 900 degrees. Uh, now, a little trivial information. Let me zoom in over here to the vacuum chamber. You see the white ring. That is a silicon pad. And generally when you're casting metals like gold and silver and lower melting temperature alloys, your hot flask can be placed directly and sealed on this silicon pad. You can see some of the burnt marks. 
the silicon pad does wear uh, you know I don't know what the life of them is but uh, you do have to replace them occasionally well because when I'm casting aluminum bronze it has a lot higher pore temperature and flash temperature my flash temperature has to be 1100 degrees well 1100 degrees in these stainless steel flasks would pretty much burn up this silicon because it's only good for about a thousand degrees so what I did is I made these little rings out of aluminum and I, I cut out a, a, a recess and a dado and I lined it, stuffed it with the asbestos. It's uh, old stock asbestos that was used in the early days for sealing cast iron plumbing pipes. And uh, the asbestos obviously will withstand quite a bit more temperature. And uh, I've used this particular asbestos ring for this this ring here, uh, oh, for probably four or five hundred cast, and it's still it's still healthy. 1,100 degrees to asbestos is just uh, you know lukewarm. So with that said, we're gonna cut the camera off here a minute and get ready for the last pour. Got a whole bunch of little small 1911 internal parts on this particular flask here. Uh, just a few more minutes, we're going to take the last flask and dunk it and see what it looks like. Okay, let's try flask number three. It's cooled down enough. Looks very good, looks very good. A bunch of, uh, bunch more of 1911 internal parts. These are the barrels and some of the internal parts. There's a total of uh, 49 castings, I'm sorry, 29 castings. There's a total of 29 castings that go into this little miniature 1911 that I'm mass producing and uh, I was hoping to let this be the last session but obviously with the one flask that we lost I might be a little short for the total number of 25 but I know I've got enough for at least 15 to start with that'll keep me busy for a couple hours okay this unit I'm focused in on now that's setting up on top of the vacuum casting machine is an antique cast iron uh, ingot mold and what I'm going to do at the end of this last pour, I've still got, there will still be molten metal remaining in the graphite crucible. So after I pour the flask, uh, I will set the, the mold will be sitting down on the asbestos pad of the table. And I will pour it with the residue metal that's left in the, in the electric furnace. 
and when it cools I'll have a, an ingot that can easily be bandsawed can be recast in the future so after I pour the flask uh, watch the operation where I pour and fill the ingot mold with the leftover molten metal Okay, here's a, a close-up of the last flask that I just poured. Uh, to the left is the ingot mold. It just about filled, but you can see a, a little bit of the solidified bronze at the top of the mold. We'll open it up after it cools later on. Okay, I thought I'd get a close-up of the flask that the bottom got sucked out of and busted. This is, uh, got it setting up. If you look real close, uh, down the, the center hole was the main sprue that all the wax components were attached to. And what you see is little channels coming in. That's where the, uh, the waxes were attached to that center sprue. And as you pour the molten metal in from the, from the bottom of the flask, uh, the atmospheric pressure, because the flask is under vacuum, forces and pushes the molten metal into these little cavities that radiate off of the, the center sprue. It's not vacuum that's actually pulling the metal in, it's the atmospheric pressure. It's similar to uh, sucking on a, a straw on a soft drink and uh, creating a pressure differential and then the atmospheric pressure is what's pushing down on the liquid in the cup and forcing it up into the straw. Sa same process. I'm going to turn this flask upside down where you can get a closer view of what the button looks like. I guess that's about a one inch uh, diameter uh, cavity and that's your your aim point when you're pouring the molten metal and you know you, you don't have much of a target but it's enough uh, we're going to take a, a shot of the last flash we poured looking at the color of the the button it appears that it's about ready to dunk so what i'm going to do is uh leave the camera set up on a a close view of this bucket and I'll remove this one and maybe you can get a bird's eye view of watching the uh, the investment uh, dissipate when it hits the water.
Okay, <clears throat> that looks like another keeper. I uh, got a barrel and a tr uh, trigger bow and then miscellaneous 1911 parts. The initial look at them, they, they look like they're all good. Uh, the rest of this investment can be hit with a high pressure garden hose and uh, just wash right off of there. It comes off fairly easy. Okay, what you see here sitting up on top of the, the vacuum unit is yesterday I cast <coughs> the four assemblies on the left. Uh, two of them are uh, Welton vices, the big vices and the small vices. Uh, there's, there's three complete vices in each grouping. And then the other two to the left uh, are vice grips. I think there's a half a dozen pair of vice grips. And then the four flashed on the right are what we just got through uh, casting and videoing today. And we can't, uh, we can't leave this video without taking one last goodbye and look at uh, the failure. So there's the one that didn't work. Uh, the investment casting process is, is very similar to baking a cake. If you follow the directions and don't fudge and don't cheat, uh, it's, it's pretty predictable, but it's not unusual to, to not have a perfect session. Let's see if we can op open this, uh, this bullet mold, or bullet mold, this uh, ingot mold. And there's our ingot that we, we made. And this can be easily bandsawed. It's, it's about a quarter of an inch thick. And then we can bandsaw it and put it back in and remelt it on our next casting session. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up and just... I took the castings uh, outside and hit them with a garden hose and washed off and hosed off most of the investment. Uh, you see the four castings that we did today and the little 1911 in the center. Let me zoom in here on a array of the parts. Uh, these are pretty much been washed free of the investment. There's the barrels. There's some, okay. Miscellaneous hammer struts and firing pins and extractors. Tell a little bit more about the parts now that they've been washed off. Okay, we're going to wrap it up with that. The uh, last step in the investment casting process is to remove the castings from your tree and uh, Probably one of the most critical parts, you really have to be careful uh, detaching your, your castings. I use two methods uh, set up in front of us on the bench here. We've got a, a Dremel tool, a motorized tool, and also a jeweler saw with a real fine jeweler saw blade in it. There's no secrets, it's just uh, be careful and cut them off. Uh, being careful to cut them as close to the, uh, the main sprue as you can and not get into the, any working part of the casting. If there was a magic secret that I could pass on to you, it would be this right here. Uh, this tube of white lubricant, referred to as bow lube, it's uh, a Boeing developed lubricant, developed by a Boeing uh, aircraft out on the west coast. And it is absolutely a fantastic lubricant to put on to bandsaw blades, jeweler saw blades, and what I found it to be most <coughs> effect <coughs> excuse me, most effective is loading up and putting the lubricant onto the uh, cutoff wheels. And uh, what it will do, it will put a light film of lubricant on the cutoff wheel and it will prevent them from overheating, which is what caused these wheels to wear down in the first place and, and typically lead to wear and breakage. But if you periodically don't let the, uh, the cutoff wheel get hot, just keep applying uh, uh, the bow lube to it periodically to keep it cool. 
uh, you'll find the life of your cutoff wheels will be tenfold. Same thing on your bandsaw blades or your jeweler saw blades. Just load it up a little bit, and it will it will make it cut quicker, faster, and uh, make your blades last longer and stay sharp and longer. So that's my testimonial for bow lube. Uh, I'm going to sit down at the chair here, cut a few off. You'll get the uh, you'll get the drift on it, and uh, then we'll wrap it up. Okay, well you've got a little room to get the uh, the cutoff wheel into the area that you want to cut off, that's fine. But on some of these it's packed in pretty tight and you don't have the room to manipulate and get it to, uh, without interfering with another one, the jiller saw blade sometimes is your, is your best. Oop. That one landed on my toe. Okay. With that, it's just kind of like eating an elephant. You do it one bite at a time until they're all off. And uh, I wish there was a, a faster way, but uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the video and possibly picked up a few tips for future projects and thanks for watching and uh, don't forget to subscribe for future videos have a nice day